So this is our first video looking at some of the introductory concepts for Chemistry 1B. So we're going to be looking at Chapter 12 and Solutions. This is Part 1. In this segment we'll be looking at what are different types of solutions and what affects solubility and some of the energetics of sol solution formation. In the next set of videos, find things that deal with concentrations and how to do conversions. And the last video, we'll look at uh, colligative properties. So there's three videos associated with Chapter 12 information. So if we're looking at solutions, those are homogeneous mixtures. So if you remember that homogeneous simply means that um, they're you know, evenly mixed, you know, you can't really separate them. It appears to be one substance, even though you can have a mixture of things in it. Um, but the composition, so the composition may vary from one sample to another. So let's say you've got Kool-Aid. One, one, one glass of Kool-Aid may be more concentrated than the other, and the other one may be more dilute, but you can still have a homogeneous mixture. So inside that glass of uh, Kool-Aid, the Kool-Aid flavoring is evenly dispersed within within the, the solvent, which is the water. So most homogeneous materials we counter are actually solutions. For example, air is a solution. You may not think of air being a solution, but it's a mixture of several different gases, such as nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. Um, Seawater is also a homogeneous solution. You've got a lot of salts in there uh, and water. And nature has a tendency towards spontaneous mixing. Uh, generally, uniform mixing is more energetically favorable. So basically what this means um, is that nature likes to make messes. So it's more natural for messes to form than things to just come together all nice and orderly and neat. Think about your bedroom. You know, just by living in your bedroom a week, no matter how many times you clean it, you put the work in to clean it, it still gets messy. So as we talk about solutions, it's a good thing to make sure that we have our definitions down. And a solute is the dissolved substance. So that's what's inside the solvent. And the solvent is the substance that the solute dissolves in. And when the solute dissolves in the solvent, it seems to disappear. And it takes on the state of the solvent. And of course, the solvent doesn't appear to change states. So if we're looking down here, We've got, you know, salt water, we've got ocean water, and inside that we've got all these water molecules, and inside we've got sodium particles and we've got chloride particles evenly dispersed within our mixture. So the sodium and the chloride would be our solute, and the water would be our solvent. So when both solute and solvent have the same state. So let's say they're both liquids, both in the same state. The solvent in the highest concentration, that has the highest amount there, is going to be the solvent. So let's say you're making a gin and tonic. And in your gin and tonic, you have mostly gin, alcohol, and a little bit of water. Well, in that case, the gin would be the solvent and the water would be the solute. Let's say you're making a gin and tonic where it's mostly tonic water with a little bit of gin. So in that case, the, the tonic water would be the solvent and the gin would be the solute. And whenever we have solutions in which the solvent is water, we call those aqueous solutions. Now, if we're talking about aqueous solutions, if you're ever... Um, been out to the ocean, um, you know, your parents probably told you don't drink the ocean water. Not only you know, is it dirty, but it's also got a high salt concentration. And what will happen is if you drink the seawater, it'll actually dehydrate you and give you diarrhea. So it kind of seems counterintuitive because you're like, oh, it's water. Why can't I use it to hydrate myself? Well, the problem is it's got a very high salt concentration. And when you ingest it, as your body tries to take in the salt water, the cell walls act as a barrier to, to the solute moving. So here, so here we have the, the water molecules in the digestive tract, and you've got all the salt particles. Well, those solute particles have a difficult time making it across that cell wall. But the water molecules can actually pass through the cell wall. So what happens is, because there's a greater concentration of these solute particles inside the digestive tract, the water 
outside the digestive tract wants to move in so that it makes the concentration of the solute the same on both sides of the wall. And so to do that, the water has to flow in and it actually flushes out the water out of your body. So this is how you get the diarrhea because all this water coming in to the digestive tract to dilute the concentration of the solute particles because solute particles can't move through the cell wall that easily. So even though you do need those, those electrolytes too much can do too much damage. But if you need to replace them, that's where Gatorade tries to strike this good balance of having, you know, the right amount of electrolytes to replace the electrolytes lost during sweating, but without so high a concentration that it actually gives you intestinal cramping and diarrhea. So some common types of solutions. There are gaseous solutions, so where the solute phase and the solvent phase are both in the gas. So air is a good example where it's mostly nitrogen and oxygen. You can have liquid solutions where you have gas dissolved in a liquid. So a good example of that would be your soda or your Coke. So you've got carbon dioxide gas dissolved in the water. So a liquid solution would be a liquid liquid. So something like vodka, so ethanol in water. A solid in liquid would be some seawater where you've got sodium chloride dissolved in water. But you can also have solid solutions. So these are your, your alloys or your metal solutions so where you have a solid dissolved in a solid. An example of that would be brass where you've got zinc in copper. So the solutions that contain a metal solutes and a metal solvent, these are called alloys. So those are mixtures of metals, those solid solutions. Examples of those are bronze, brass, and stainless steel. And a special type of alloy is an amalgam. An amalgam is just a mercury solution. And that's where you talk about amalgam fillings. It's actually mercury with some other metals and it solidifies into the, the cre crevices of the teeth to fill the cavity. And of course, you know, silver fillings aren't used as much anymore. Even, you know, we call them silver fillings when they're actually mercury fillings. Uh, not used as often anymore for cosmetic reasons. It's also because people are concerned about being exposed to mercury. Now this is just a graph to kind of give you an example of different types of brasses. And the different types of brasses are caused by the different concentrations of copper and zinc. This gilding type of brass is mostly copper with only about 5% zinc. And then as you increase the amount of zinc, notice that um, typically you're also getting higher tensile strengths. So let's see, car radiator cores. They call this cartridge brass. So it's about 70% copper and 30% zinc. So just to kind of give you an idea of different types of alloys or metal solutions. Now solubility, this is when we talk about when one, you know, whether or not a substance will dissolve in another. So when one substance, so a solute dissolves in another, so that's going to be the solvent, we say that the substance is soluble, so it will actually dissolve. So salt is actually soluble in water. So you've got sodium chloride and you've got water. And if I look at the Lewis dot structure of these, remember water and that OH bond is very uh, polar. So water is a very polar molecule. We, we look at the, some of those vectors. And sodium chloride is very ionic. So we've got very polar substances. So these would be soluble in each other. And if we have, look at bromine, bromine is soluble in methylene chloride. So bromine, remember, is a liquid. It's a diatomic. So one of those things that you had to remember from your naming from uh, your first semester chemistry. So bromine is a diatomic liquid. And because, you know, if we look at the Lewis dot structure, because it's both the same thing on either side of that bond, we don't have a polar bond, so this is a nonpolar molecule. And if we compare, also look at methylene chloride, so methylene chloride is also called dichloromethane. And if we look at the differences in electronegativity of chlorine and carbon, there's not a big difference between those electronegativities. So we really don't have much of a, a dipole there. So even though it is a polar molecule, it's only a slightly polar molecule. It has a very small dipole moment. So in this case, um, the bromine will dissolve in the, the methylene chloride. Now, if something doesn't dissolve in another, we say it's insoluble. For example, oil is insoluble in water. 
and oil is a typically a, like a long chain hydrocarbon. So I'm just each one of those bins or those points represents a carbon atom. So this would be the same thing as so if I did CH3. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you got three hydrogens attached there. You got H2s there. And I'm just drawing a generic molecule to represent the oil. So I'm just drawing a generic long chain hydrocarbon. And if we look at the differences in electronegativities of the carbon and hydrogen, those two are very small. So we basically only have London dispersion forces if we're looking at the intermolecular forces of the oil. And if we compare that to the water, remember we said the water is very polar and actually has hydrogen bonding. That's a very strong type of intermolecular force. So because they have different types of intermolecular forces, they don't dissolve well in each other. And we'll explain a little bit more about this and explain this more in detail later on. So the, so the solubility of one substance in another depends on two factors. And that's nature's tendency towards mixing. Remember, that's that entropy. Things like to get messy and the types of intramolecular f attractive forces. So this is going to be more of the um, enthalpy terms, so the delta H's of reactions, so those, the types of intramolecular attractive forces. So we're going to go back to that concept of entropy and mixing. So here we're looking at a tank. On one side we've got just pure water, and on the other side we've got a sodium chloride uh, solution. So we've got chlorides in there, we've got sodium in, in there, and they're all solvated by the water in there. Now if we remove this barrier, what's going to happen? They're going to mix. So as soon as I take that wall out, you know, the chlorides are going to spread out to the other side and the, and the chlorines are going to spread out, so they're all going to be mixed and evenly dispersed within the whole tank eventually. Now, when we're talking about solubility, there's usually a limit to the amount of one substance will dissolve in another. So there's usually a limit to the solubility. Now, gases are always soluble in each other. This is because there's so much space in between the gas molecules, it's easier, easy to fit other gas molecules in there. So gases are always soluble in other gases. And when two liquids that are mutually soluble we usually say that these are miscible, so they mix. Miscible just means that uh, the two liquids mix. So alcohol and water are miscible, but oil and water are immiscible, so M meaning not. And the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved in a given amount of sol solvent is called the solubility. So the solubility describes the maximum amount that will go into solution. And the solubility of one substance with another is going to be variable based upon the temperature and pressure. So by changing the temperature you can change the solubility and by changing the pressure of, um, you can also change the solubility. Now the formation of a solution does not necessarily lower the potential energy of the system. So the difference in attractive forces between the atoms of two separate ideal gases versus two mixed ideal gases is negligible. So if we're looking at neon and argon, when we mix these two together, because there's so much space in between these and, you know, the only type of intermolecular forces we have between these are London dispersion forces, and even this, those dispersion forces don't have a lot of influence over the neon and the argon because those gases are so far apart they really don't feel those attractive forces that much. So even though we really don't see a difference in the attractive forces between you know the neon and the argon they do mix and this has to do with the entropy so this idea of mixing. So the gases mix because the energy of the system is lowered through the release of entropy. So in the case of gases, because, you know, it's not the changes in the, the enthalpy, so the energetics, the attractive forces, it's going to be the energetics associated with the 
the randomness of the, the system. The randomness of the system is what's going to cause the mixing of the, of the two. And again, entropy is the measure of energy dispersal throughout the system. And a lot of times you'll hear entropy being referred to as the randomness of the system or the, the disorder of the system. So energy has a spontaneous drive to spread out over as large a volume as it's allowed. So we saw in our picture here that the neon and the argon spread out to all sides of the box and it was limited to our box that contained it. Now if we put a hole in here, you know, they could spread out and go through and cover uh, the entire area and just kind of spread out. So we're going to get into more of that enthalpy term. So we looked at gases, we said, you know, there's not a lot of enthalpy um, differences between the two systems before they mix and after they mix. But with other systems, the enthalpy is going to, to play a factor. So the enthalpy is related to the attractive forces. So energy changes in the formation of most solutions also involve differences in attractive forces between the particles. So if we look at this solution here, you know, there's going to be there's solvent-solvent interactions, so there's some attractions here. There's also solute-solute interactions, there's attractions there, but there are also solvent and solute interactions. So all those play a key component as to whether or not something will mix and dissolve in one another. So for a solution to form, it must overcome the solute-solute attractive forces. So you've got to break the solute-solute interactions so that you get more of the solvent and solute interactions. And you've also got to break the solvent-solvent interactions so that you can get these solvent and solute interactions. And at least some of the energy to do this, to overcome the solvent-solvent interactions and the solute-solute interactions, comes from the solvent and solute interactions. Now if you're overcoming the solute-solute attractive forces, you've got to put energy into the system to break that attraction. So if you put energy in, you've got to deposit energy into the system. So think of your bank account, you're doing a deposit in, so that's a positive value, and that's an endothermic reaction. And if you've got to overcome the solvent-solvent attractive forces, that's also going to be endothermic. Now if you're making the new solvent-solute interaction, so making a bond or having an interaction, that's an exothermic reaction because that's a favorable to form that interaction. So if that interaction is formed, energy is released. And if energy comes out, remember that's a negative change in your energy bank accounts. So you're taking money out. So that's an exothermic reaction. Okay, so if we're going to talk about these different types of interactions between the solvent and solvent, the solute and solute and solvent and the solute, we have to look at the intermolecular forces. So we're going to review our intermolecular forces from Chem 1A. So if I'm looking at this heptane and pentane, and it's nice, they've already got the structure drawn out for me, I don't have to draw the Lewis dot structure. And when I see this, all I see is a lot of carbon-hydrogen bonds. And with those carbon-hydrogen bonds, that tells me that we basically have dispersion forces or London dispersion forces as our type of intermolecular forces and that's the main thing so you got dispersion forces and remember those are very weak forces in between now if we look at our next example where you have dipole dipole intermolecular forces remember this acetone is still all of these still have dispersion forces so I'm going to go ahead and write this down below dispersion and dispersion for the chloroform as well. But here you've got the carbon, let's go ahead and draw it like this, but you've got that carbon oxygen bond, that's a polar bond, and we have a net dipole for another molecule, so we have a dipole. And with the chloroform we also have a dipole as well. So if we draw our Lewis dot structure, another chlorine, and a third chlorine. So we have a net dipole in this direction. So this also has a dipole. So even though these both have dispersion forces, the dipole is a stronger intermolecular force, so that's what I'm focusing on when I say this is a, has a dipole-dipole interaction. 
So remember this has a partial negative end, this has a partial positive, and this will be attracted to the partial positive end of the chloroform, and then we got the partial negative on this side. Okay, so we're going across from left to right, we're having stronger and stronger types of intramolecular forces. So with the ethanol, I'm going to draw that out so we can see it a little easier. Okay. So with the ethanol, we have this OH group. So yes, that's a polar bond, and it's also a polar molecule, but this is a special type of polar bond. I, when I teach Kim 1A, I remind my students of the funny way to spell phone. So if it has a FH or an OH or an NH, then you've got to think about hydrogen bonding, and hydrogen bonding is a special type of dipole it's a much stronger type of dipole. So in the ethanol we have the OH and it can hydrogen bond with the water which also has OH groups. So you get that interaction there. So that interaction is the hydrogen bond. Yes, the ethanol has dispersion forces. Yes, it has dipole, but it has hydrogen bonding and that's the big gorilla in the, the room. So that's going to be our strongest type. So you get a very strong interaction between the ethanol and the water. Now our last type of intermolecular force, it's the strongest of the intermolecular forces, it's the ion dipole. I mean that you have an ion, so we have a sodium ion there, that cation, and we have an interaction with a dipole, so a polar molecule. So there we've got the water molecule. Remember it's got its partial positive end and its partial negative end. And so that negative end is going to be attracted, so this negative end here is going to be attracted to the sodium molecule. And notice that all of these water molecules are all oriented in the same direction. The negative end is all pointed towards the sodium cation because you've got very strong ion dipole interaction. So we, whenever we look at solubility, these are the things that we're looking at. What type of intramolecular forces are present and what's the strongest one that's there? So we have to do this analysis every time that we look at whether or not something's soluble in another substance. Now, looking at the relative interactions and whether or not a solution forms. If the interactions between the solute and solvent, so if my solute to solvent interactions are stronger than the solute and solute interactions and the solvent-solvent interactions, then we're going to get a solution, so they're going to mix. Now if the solute to solvent interactions are the same as the solute to solute and the solvent to solvent interaction, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think a solution will form or not? To me, it's, you know, if I were just looking at this and, and I didn't have my experience, I'd say, well, I don't know, they're equal. Well, a solution will form because there's also the entropy contribution. So it doesn't matter which way, because you, the molecules are like, ah, I can be with this sol solute molecule says I can be with a solute or I can be with a solvent. No big deal, no big energy changes. So we're going to get a solution formed just due to the entropy. Now if the solute to solvent interactions are less than, if the sum of those solute and solvent interactions, so when the solution forms, are less than the solute to solute and the solvent to solvent. So remember on this column we're talking about the unmixed and here we're talking about after it's mixed. So if the mixture interactions are less than the, the non-mixed, then the solution may or may not form. It may be soluble or it may not. So it's like, holy, well how do I know this? So when the solute to solvent attractions are weaker than the sum of the solute to solute and solvent to solvent attractions. The solution will only form if the energy difference is small enough to be overcome by the entropy. So this is where the entropy comes into play. So if it creates a more disordered solution when they combine. So will it dissolve? The chemist rule of thumb is like dissolve like. So polar substances will dissolve in polar solvents, nonpolar substances will dissolve in nonpolar solvents. So this is what we talk about when we say like dissolves like. We have similar types of intramolecular attractions. 
So a chemical will dissolve in a solvent if it has a similar structure to the solvent. And when the solvent and solute structures are similar, the solvent molecules will attract the solute particles at least as well as the solute particles to each other. The in interaction here is more favorable or about the same. We're going to get this two to, to mix. So let's look at how we classify solvents as something, whether it's polar or nonpolar. So water, if we look at that Lewis dot structure, remember it has those two OH groups, those two hydrogens attached to the oxygen. This is a very polar molecule. So it has the, the two polar bonds to make the very polar molecule, and it has the hydrogen bonding, so this is definitely a very polar s substance. Methyl alcohol also has an OH group, so this is also very polar. Ethyl alcohol also has an OH group, so it's also very polar. Acetone, remember we have to kind of draw that structure to kind of better see what that looks like, but it is also polar because you've got that carbon-oxygen double bond. you got that CH3 and the CH3. So that CO group there makes it polar. A toluene is nonpolar. Oh, that's a very bad hexagon. So we've got seven carbons. I've drawn six right there. I'm going to draw another carbon there. And three hydrogens to make a methyl group coming off. And we've got some double bonds there. And we've got these hydrogens. Okay, so not the prettiest picture, but hopefully you get the idea. So you have a six-membered carbon ring, and you've got a methyl group, so the CH3 coming off of one of the the sides of the, the the ring. So these were all carbon carbon bonds and carbon hydrogen bonds and so these are make the molecule nonpolar. And then hexane also very nonpolar so that's a chain of six carbons one two three four five six and with just hydrogens attached to it so those are nonpolar. Uh, ether is nonpolar so if we draw that structure out We've got an oxygen in the middle and two carbons on each side. So CH3, CH3, you've got hydrogens there and a hydrogen there and a hydrogen and a hydrogen. The way I've drawn out the Lewis dot structure can be a little bit misleading. So I'm going to draw it kind of looking at, here's what I'm kind of looking at from the top. Let me draw it another way. Because remember that oxygen has two long pairs if we're doing the lowest dot structure. So it's actually a bent molecule. So even though we have polar bonds and we've got some polar aspects to the molecule, we've also got a lot of carbon hydrogen bonds and carbon carbon bonds. So in this case, those nonpolar interactions are overwhelming the polar part of the molecule. So this is what causes the diethyl to be nonpolar. So even though we have a polar component to it, it's less than the sum of the nonpolar components. So this kind of overpowers that one polar part of it. Now if we look at carbon tetrachloride, so you've got four chlorides all around the carbon. So the carbon chloride is polar. But because these are all evenly spaced about the molecule, they're going to cancel each other out, those vectors. So this is going to make that solvent nonpolar. So carbon TED is a nonpolar solvent. So this is where we have to draw on our knowledge from Chem 1A to draw our Lewis dot structures uh, so that we can figure out whether something's polar or not. And we have to look at our electronegativities to classify the types of intermolecular forces, and this will help us understand the solubilities of these solvents. Okay, so let's look at an example. They want us to predict whether the following vitamin is soluble in fat or water. So is vitamin C soluble in fat or water? So remember water, very polar, and fat is has a lot of hydrocarbons. So you can think of a, like a long chain hydrocarbon, but mainly you're going to have carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds in fat. So when I start to analyze the vitamin C, I look, I'm like, oh, I've got, I've got a polar bond there. You know, I've got, look at that, I've got a polar bond there, I've got a polar bond there, I've got hydrogen bonding capabilities there, I've got OHs, I've got lots of OHs. So I'm like, okay, I could have a lot of hydrogen bonding with the vitamin C. 
hydrogen bonding, no hydrogen bonding in the fat, so probably not going to be soluble in the fat, but oh look, water, a lot of OH groups. So you have a lot of possibilities of, you know, those interacting. So let's see, you've got that lone pair there and another lone pair on that one to interact with the water molecules. So vitamin C is very soluble in water. Looking at, we're just highlighting those OH groups. So the four OH groups make the molecule highly polar, so it will also hydrogen bond to the water. So vitamin C is water soluble. So this is why you need to be careful when cooking some of your vegetables, like bell peppers or, or some other vegetables. If you're boiling them in water, the vitamin C is very water soluble. You're going to be leaching out a lot of the, you know, the vitamins from the vegetables into the the water. So if you throw that water away, you're losing a lot of the vitamin C content that you thought you were getting. So uh, be careful about the way you prepare your vegetables. Uh, Other steaming is a very good way of maintaining a lot of the nutritional content of your your vegetables. So here we have an example of another type of vitamin. This one's vitamin K. And they want to know whether the vitamin K is fat or water soluble. So as I start analyzing the vitamin K, I notice a lot of carbon-carbon bonds, a lot of carbon-hydrogen bonds. I do have two carbon-oxygen bonds, and those are polar. But look at the directions of what they're pulling. This one is, you got a polar vector in this direction, and you got a polar vector in this direction. So if I to add those two vectors up, they're going to cancel each other out. I'm not going to get a net dipole. So in fact, vitamin K is actually fat soluble. So it's not going to dissolve in water. Vitamin K is fat soluble. Those, even though you've got those two carbon oxygen groups that are polar, their geometric symmetry suggests that the pools of those uh, dipole moments will cancel each other out and the molecule will be nonpolar. So this is why it's also sometimes good to have a, a salad dressing that has some fat content to it so that you can actually extract some of the vitamin K or some of the other fat-soluble vitamins so that you can actually digest some of those and actually incorporate that um, into your body without losing it. So a little fat is actually good for you because some vitamins are actually fat-soluble.